my friends how are you today welcome on to our 40 day plan on getting a new life so what's this idea about a new life a new life is a new thought is a, a new way of thinking a new way of looking at life a new way of being you so we decided to come on to you with this amazing book called The Purpose Driven Life and the question was what on earth am I here for? So we've been carrying on reading this book and sharing it with you and the whole idea was to make sure that we all read it together and for me personally um, it's really been amazing it's been a lot of eye-opening knowledge which I'm hoping you are getting as well so where are we today? Um, remember it's a 40 day plan. So 40 day being 40 day, 40 day is all about 40 chapters. And we're taking them chapter by chapter. And today is actually chapter 13, which is day 13. So what we're encouraging us to do is, let's all have a nice, beautiful discussion. So if you've noticed any change in your life, and it's been useful to you please feel free to let us know um, we also will be quite excited to share with you whatever we are thinking uh, we also will say a big hi to you if you come on and say hi to us so we just want interaction with this let's see how this helps all of us because I'm hoping that by the end of 40 days we should all have very very good testimonials something to to say you know thanking God for his amazing support in our lives um, because I know for sure that something good is going to come out of this and what really excited me or touched me was the fact that I am so committed to doing this 40 whole days out of my calendar in, in a year is really something and normally I have a lot of things piled up to do people that know me know that but I put everything aside and I'm dealing with this and I was just saying to my 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 family today that it's just God that spoke to me to do this and I'm sure it is God that's actually doing this because my regular self I'll be arguing with this why should I take this on when I have so much more to deal with this is just another work but you know what God's ways is the best and he knows why he does what he does sometimes so welcome on board today and we're gonna get on with it so today's chapter 13 and the title says worship that pleases God we're looking at a worship that pleases God. So what's this worship? Again, we're live on Instagram and we're live on Facebook. And then we are recording this for YouTube. So we have all the places where you can feel free to chat with us and tell us what you're thinking. So love the Lord your God with all your heart. That's the beginning. And with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. That's the very opening of chapter 3. And it's Mark 12, Mark, Mark 12, um, 30, verses 30. And the next one was, God wants all of you. That's what it says, God wants all of you. God does not want a part of our life. He asks for all our hearts, all our soul all our mind and all our strength so that's what god wants from all of us god does not want half-hearted commitment partial obedience and the leftovers of our time and money so you see how this connects with what we are actually talking about god wants everything he doesn't want partial commitment he wants our full devotion not little bits of our life that's the god we worship he gave an example. He said, a, Sar a Samaritan woman once debated with Jesus over the best time, place, and style for worship. Jesus replied that these were irrelevant. So if you're sitting down there and wondering, where is the best place to worship? When is the best time to worship? What's the best style of worship? That, that's not what God wants from us. Jesus said to this Samaritan woman, that's irrelevant. He said, where you worship is not as important as why you worship and how much of yourself you offer to God when you do worship. So the other day we were talking about obedience is better than sacrifice. 
this is another example of it. It says, he said, where you worship is not as important as why you worship and how much you worship. And I mean, how much of yourself you offer to God when you worship. So this is probably just hitting at some of us who think it is only when we go to church that we're worshiping. But we'll go a bit further to understand what he said. There is a right word. And no, there is a right way and a wrong way to worship. The Bible says, let us be grateful and worship God in a way that will please him. So it's about us pleasing God. So it says we should worship God in a way that will please him. Worship that pleases, that pleases God has four characteristics. So now he's going to break it down again. You know, like when he breaks it down, he tells us this is why he thinks this is this. And then he explains what is going on. So number one, God is pleased when our worship is accurate. That's when God is really pleased. And how? what does that involve? It says, do not create your image of God. So this is what most of us do. We tend to create our image of God. He said, worship must be based on the truth of the scripture, not our opinion about God. So lots of us create this opinion about God, but that's not what it should be. It should be based on what the scripture says. True worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. So if we are worshipping God in spirit and in truth, that is the kind of people that God is looking for. The worshipping truth means to worship God as he is truly revealed in the Bible. We worship God the way he is revealed in the Bible gradually getting through and making a bit of sense so number two is God is pleased when our worship is authentic remember the first one is God is pleased please when our worship is accurate now God is pleased when our worship is authentic authentic means genuine when it's real when Jesus said you must worship in spirit he wasn't referring to the Holy Spirit because lots of us once we hear spirit we think oh yeah because God left us, uh, Jesus left us with the Holy Spirit. So now that's the, that's the spirit they're talking about. He was talking about our spirit. So God wants us to worship him in our spirit. So made in God's image, that's what we are. We are made in God's image. We are a spirit that resides in a body. So this we've understood over and over when he, the, this book keeps reminding us and the Bible also reminds us that we're going to be here just about 70, 80 and sometimes 100 years and then we move on. Moving on means you then leave the body. So what's this thing that leaves the body? What leaves the body is the spirit. And so when God says we should worship him in spirit, he's referring to that spirit that's in, in us. So God, man, um, we are made in God's image, and so we are a spirit that resides in a body. So we are a spirit, but we live in this physical body. And is this physical body that then gets tired? Is this physical body that then picks up all kind of illnesses? Is this physical body that gets really, really, you know, starts to decay with time in the sense of we get older, and some of us will start getting wrinkly, and all kinds of things starts to happen to us. That's what this happens to this physical body. So, when God says we reside in the body, it's the spirit that resides in the body. And it's the spirit that moves on. So God designed our spirit to communicate with him. And that's what happens. Our spirit communicates with God. So that's why God wants us to worship him in spirit. Worship is our spirit responding to God's spirit. So remember, we were created in God's image. And it's the spirit that resides in the body. And it's that spirit that God wants us to worship him with. When Jesus said, love God with all your heart and soul, he meant that worship must be genuine and heartfelt. So heart and soul, that's the message here. We should worship him with our heart and our soul. It is not about, um, it's not about saying the right words. You must mean what you say. So when most of us are in church and we're just repeating, you know, sometimes we just repeat things. And sometimes it gets so 
automatic in our brain that we just know what to say. But it, are we really feeling it? So that's a big question. Are we really feeling these things that we're saying? So heartless praise is not praise at all. So that's what he's reminding us. When we just say these things without even thinking about it, that's not praise. We're not praising God at all. It is worthless and it is an insult. So if you know you're, you're thinking of talking to your father and you don't think you should be really heartfelt about it. Uh, the last chapter we were really trying to talk about this friendship with God and how he wants to hear our every thought and everything that's going on with us. So if you're not are talking to God and you don't make it heartfelt, he says it's an insult to God. And when we worship God, when we worship, God sees past our words to look at the attitude of our heart. So every time we are talking to God and we're just repeating these words that we've read somewhere or seen somewhere, that God sees past those words and he's actually seen inside your heart. The Bible says man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. So that's so typical and that's why you normally hear this saying that um, don't, don't judge a book by the cover or you know like most times when you go buy anything and I think all of us do it we just look at how glossy and how nicely packaged this thing is and then we want it because it's so beautifully packaged and so that's mad for you but God doesn't see that beautiful package God doesn't God sees past all these words that we are amazing words that we're throwing out he sees our heart since worship involves delighting in God it engages our emotions so if you're worshiping God you need to know that your emotions should be involved not just throwing words out without thinking about it you see God gave us emotions so we could worship him with deep feelings so whenever we are worshiping God, we should make sure our feelings are deeply involved. Just like the friendship uh, chapter we talked about. It's about saying exactly how we feel about whatever we're saying without just throwing words out. But those emotions must be genuine, not fake, or pretense, or funniness in worship. So whenever we're talking to God, no funniness, no pretenses, no fakeness just be as genuine as possible he wants our honest real love that's the god we, we serve he wants us to love him real and honestly um, we can worship god imperfectly but we cannot worship worship him insincerely so some of us may really not know how to worship god but that sincerity you have to be sincere when you're talking to god because he sees everything Sincerity alone is not enough. We can't be sincerely wrong. This is why spirit and truth are needed. That's why the first passage was worshiping him in truth, with all your strength, with all your mind. All of that is what God wants from us. Worship must be accurate and authentic. It must be real. We use both our heart and our head when we worship him. But we need to do that. Today, most of us equate emo emotionally moved um, by music as being by the spirit. But they they're not the same. And this one is extremely true because most churches that you go to, all you're getting is these amazing songs going on. And the songs could be, you know, with drums and people are dancing and getting so excited. We go for that to explain this. But that does not necessarily mean worship. Because what's happening there is most of us think that that is worship, that that's not worship. Real worship happens when our spirit responds to God. Remember we just talked about spirit now, not to just musical tone. So when you're hearing all these amazing songs and you know the drums beating and people are clapping and all kinds of things are happening and you are getting moved, that does not necessarily mean worship. So again, if this is making any sense, just please feel free, talk to us, chat with us, we're happy to chat with you. Actually, some songs hinder worship because they take the spotlight of God and focus on our feelings. So when you're hearing other songs and you're getting really moved, which I know for sure I've been one of those. I'm in church and I'm hearing all these songs and I'm getting really excited. 
So when we do that, what's happening is our, our attention is shifted away from God. And our attention is not all about our feelings, how we are feeling. You see, our biggest distraction in worship is ourselves. Our interest and our worries over what others think about us. So most times we're in church thinking that we're worshiping, we're actually thinking about ourselves. We're thinking about what people are thinking about us. Instead of us to be focusing on what we really want to share, what our spirit wants to share with God. You see, many forms of worship are mentioned in the Bible. And he starts to explain them to us. He says, a form of worship is confessing. Another form is kneeling. Another form is singing, dancing, shouting, making a joyful noise, testifying, playing, playing musical instruments, raising hands, standing in honor. So all of these various things, the Bible has explained it, that these are just different ways that we can worship God. But the best style of worship is the one that most authentically represents our love for God based on the background and personality that God gave you. To me, that's the biggest part of this passage, this chapter. This is the biggest thing we have to take out of it. It says when we worship God, the best style of worshiping is the one that most authentically represents our love for God. And it's based on the background and personality that God gives us, gave us. So, truth is, we are all different. We are all individually based. And coming from the earlier chapters, we've been told that God individually gave us different talents and skills, which we all know that. And that's why most times I always say to most of us, there is really no need to be jealous of each other or envious of each other or start bearing grudges against each other because we are all different we have all been wired differently and for as long as we're all different people we cannot be the same people and if we're not the same people what is the point getting angry or, or getting jealous when you see somebody doing something good all you have to do is praise that person and thank that person for actually taking the courage to present what god has given them but anyway here he's trying to explain that the best style of worship is the one that most authentically represents our individual love for God and is also based on the background and personality that we are. So this goes to explain that we should not all be standing there and doing exactly what everybody else is doing. Do that one thing, do the thing that really touches your spirit, that represents who you are as a person. And he explains, he said, there's a guy called Gary Thomas, and he noticed that most Christians, most Christians get stuck in a worship, in a worship rut. And this is an unsatisfying routine. Rather than having a vibrant friendship with God, this is what we do. We just get into a rut. A rut is all about you just repeating yourself every day, doing the same thing over and over and over. And that's not what worship should be. God is not pleased with that type of worship. This is because we have forced ourselves to use devotional methods, worship styles that don't fit the way God uniquely shaped us. So we've just explained that. So because we are all so different, all we follow this, this is the way it's been written down for centuries and years and years, so just follow that pattern. This, this same Gary wondered, if God intentionally made us all different, why should everyone be expected to love God in the same way? Gary found out there have been different parts of worship for over 2,000 years. He researched and picked on a few, and he started explaining different ways that it's been done over the years. Being outdoors, singing, breathing, dancing, studying, creating arts, serving others, having solitude, enjoying fellowship, and many others. There is no one size fits all approach to worship. And friendship with God. So there's no one size that fits all and says this is the only way you can worship God. So the message here is we can all individually worship God the way that pleases our soul, that makes sense, that makes us feel closer to God and where we can actually express ourselves to God depending on our unique needs. You don't bring glory to God by trying to be someone he never intended us to be. So you, you're not going to make God happy by you being somebody else if you're not being yourself. God wants us to be ourselves. So that's a big message here. 
That's the kind of people the Father is out looking for. Those who are simply and honestly themselves before Him in their worship. Big message. So whenever you're worshiping God, remember who you are. And remember to portray that person to God. And remember to stick to what your unique needs are and what your spirit is talking about and what makes you happy and different and can communicate with God. So that's the other way he says, God is pleased when our worship is thoughtful. Thoughtful, we think about it. Jesus command to love God with all your mind. So Jesus did say to us, to us, we should remember to love God with all our mind. God is not pleased with thoughtlessness. Singing of hymns, perfect, perform, perfunctory praying of cliches or careless exclamations of praise the Lord. And I know about this, especially in our Nigerian churches where I come from. This is all you hear. Everyone screaming, praise the Lord. Because we can't think of anything else to say at that moment. So all we think is praise the Lord. And that just becomes what goes on constantly. He said, if worship is mindless, it is meaningless. So if you go to church and all you're saying is praise the Lord and praise the Lord, it is mindless, invariably meaningless. So we must engage our minds. Jesus called thoughtless worship vain repetition so when you just go to church just to be screaming for the sake of screaming without connecting any sense to it that's vain repetition even biblical terms can become tired cliches from overuse and we stop thinking about the meaning of it so biblical terms can just become so tiring that it doesn't make any sense anymore it is much easier to offer cliches in worship instead of making the effort to honor God with fresh words and, and ways. So, he said, try praising God without using popular words. And the popular words he's given us is, Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Amen, Amen. Thanks be to God. That Those are popular cliches and they usually end up becoming meaningless because we're not connecting with them. He said we should try new words instead of the old ones. For example, instead of praise, we should use words like synonyms that, that say the same thing but used in another form. So you admire God. You adore Him. You respect Him. You value Him. You revere Him. You honor Him. You appreciate Him. So when you use words like that, it makes a bit more sense than just repeating the same old thing. Praising God with other words, synonyms that are different from the same tired cliches we've been using. So he says we should be specific with God. He gave us an example. He said, imagine if someone said repeatedly to you, I praise you, I praise you, I praise you. Say so ten times this person says that. You are wondering now, for what? What are you praising me for? You would rather have two specific words or compliments. So it is better this person just said something specific to you. At least if it's just two, it's still okay. Than 20 vague gener generalities. I praise you. I praise you. Uh, you know, so what he's saying is we shouldn't throw meaningless words to God. We should be very specific when we're talking to God. So he wants us to do the same thing with God. So try making a list of different names of God and focus on them. In the Bible, there's so many names that God has. God's names are not arbitrary. They, they tell us about different aspects of his character. Well, I was hoping he was going to give us all those names, but he didn't. So I think it's our task now to go and search in the Bible and find the different names. I actually have received an email in the past. Not email, um, it was a message that really lined out all the different names of God. And I think I wrote it out in a book, but I'll have to look for it and see if I can find it. So that's the task he's asking us to find. Find these different names and speak to God and call those names. In the Old Testament, God revealed himself to Israel by introducing new names for himself and he commands us to praise his name. So by saying these names and praising him, we're doing more. We're actually speaking to God. God wants our corporate worship. Uh, 
our corporate worship gatherings to be thoughtful too. So wherever we've called our church that we attend to, these places should be thoughtful as well, not just throwing the same things over and over and over at us. Paul said, everything should be done in a fitting and or the um, or, or orderly way. So instead of us just throwing something there without being orderly about it, we should be very organized about how we worship God. God insists that our worship service be understandable to unbelievers when they are present in our worship garden. So this is an example of where this is where you worship and then complete strangers come in. But because you are so unorganized about it, they have no clue what you're doing. We should be able to make it understandable to a complete new person who walks in. And that was how he analyzed that particular topic. So the next one is God is pleased when our worship is practical. So God wants us to be very practical when we're talking to him. The Bible says, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. And this is our spiritual act of worship. Why does God want our body? Why doesn't he say, offer your spirit? This is because without the body, our spirit cannot do anything on this earth. So that is absolutely true. Because the spirit lives in the body. And so, if the body is not there, which is when we move on, or, or transition, or, or pass on, once the spirit is no longer there, or rather the body is weak and is, can no longer carry the spirit, you really cannot function on this earth because it's the body that actually makes you function here. So the spirit needs the body to act on this very earth because the, the minute the spirit, the body is gone and the spirit has moved on, the spirit cannot you know, exist here anymore. As long as we are here on earth, our spirit can only be where our body is. That is clear understanding. In worship, we are to offer our bodies as loving sacrifices. God wants us to use our body to offer him as loving sacrifices. God wants us to be a living sacrifice. He wants us to, to live for him. So he's told his told us this over and over. We need to understand that he created us and we should live for him. In the Old Testament, God took pleasure in the many sacrifices of worship because they told of Jesus' sacrifice for us on the cross. Now, God is pleased with a different sacrifice of worship. And these are the type of worship that God wants. Thanksgiving, praise, humility, Repentance, offerings of money, prayer, servicing others, sharing with those in need. Real sacrifices are quite expensive. And David explained it. He said, I will not offer to the Lord my God sacrifice that cost me nothing. So we, whenever we're trying to offer our praises to God and offer sacrifice to God, we should consider that this is our creator and not go and give him something that means nothing to us. One thing worship costs us is our self-centeredness. We cannot exalt God and ourselves at the same time. And doing this program really, really made me understand what they are referring to. It says when you want to worship, you must give in some, you must give something. We cannot exalt God and ourselves at the same time. And that's why I said real sacrifice is very expensive. We should not worship to be seen by others or to please ourselves. Deliberately shift the focus. When Jesus said, love God with all your strength, he pointed out that worship takes energy and effort. So whenever you want to worship God, be willing and be ready to give energy and effort. It is not always convenient and comfortable. So whenever you want to worship God, be very clear that it may not be a convenient time. Remember when we started, I said, when is the right time to worship God? And where is the right place to worship God? Sometimes worship is a sheer act of the will. That's another big message for us here. It's a sheer act of the will. The willingness. The willingness that you have decided to take on. That's what worship should be. A willing sacrifice. 
And when you praise God, even when you don't feel like it, now that's worship. You're, you're really down. Things haven't happened the way you were thinking they should happen. And in spite of whatever it is, you're saying, you know what, Heavenly Father, thank you for today. And this is how I'm feeling, but I praise you, I thank you. All of those are the kind of worship that God wants to hear. Worship that's real and genuine. When you get out of bed to worship and you're really tired, that's a good time to worship. When you help others when you're worn out, you're really worn out, but you know what? This person needs my help. I really must give it to you. That's the kind of sacrifice God wants. You are offering a sacrifice of worship when you do that to God. And these are the kind of sacrifices that pleases God. So like I was explaining earlier, me agreeing to take on these 40 days to do this program, read this book to the out there, to the world. And I know how much sacrifice I'm putting into this. It hasn't been convenient at all. But the minute my spirit said, take this on, and I took it on, I feel good about it. it Maybe tiring. Sometimes I'm really tired because I got so many activities going on during the day. And like today, we're actually doing this like 12 midnight UK time. But we've decided to take it on, and that's why we're all here, the crew and myself, we're all sitting down here dealing with this, all the electricity and all the things that's happening behind the scenes. We've agreed to do it, so we're here, that sacrifice. And he explains, Matt Redman tells how his pastor taught his church the real meaning of worship. Worship is more than music. So this pastor band all singing in their service for a period of time, where they learn to worship in other ways. So by the end of the period, Matt wrote a classic song, and the song was called Heart of Worship. He says, I'll bring you more than a song, for a song itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within. Through the way, the way things appear, you're looking into my heart. The heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. That's what this young man talked about, Matt Redman. So we're going to finish today with our usual question. I don't know, where did I keep my question? Uh, okay, let's take it from here. Yes, it's right here. So, question is, which is more pleasing to God right now? My public worship or my private worship? That's the question he wants us to ask ourselves. And he's asking us, what will I do about this? But before we finally close down meditation, we did say we'll be looking at meditation that we'll think about during the day. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And this is Mark 12, verse 30. So, thank you so much for watching. Thank you for being part of this program. We really look forward to seeing you tomorrow. And sleep on all we've talked about. Have any questions, feel free to ask. Chat with us. We look forward to seeing you. And may God continue to bless you eternally.